Okay. Well, anyway, so um, we're going we're gonna to move on to uh, image optimization. And, um, but before we do, I just wanted to uh, answer a question that was asked of me after the last lecture. So the question was, uh, so in chemical shift of the first kind, that's when the water image and the fat image sort of move relative to one another. The question was, so is that because the water, we think the water protons are in one location, but they're actually in a different location. That's exactly what's happening. Is that, and maybe I didn't make it, I'm sorry for not making it clear. What happens is, in reality, the water is where the water is and the fat is where the fat is. But we don't know exactly where they are. So we do an MR image and try to figure out where they are. But our ability to figure out where these protons really is is not perfect. And so chemical shift of the first kind occurs because we think the water protons are in one location, but they're actually not. They've been shifted over. Alternatively, it's the fat protons that are shifted in the other direction. So we think the protons are in one location, but they're not exactly in that right in that location, and that's what causes the the the, the mismapping, is what causes the chemical shift of the first kind. Okay, so we've reviewed some basic uh, MR uh, physics. How do we translate that now into image optimization? Um, Hold on, I think I might have had a crash. No, there we go. Okay, so this is my son. Uh, now he's actually studying chemistry, uh, but MR physics is maybe even more difficult uh, than uh, chemistry. So why is this so difficult? Because we're gonna try to take that knowledge that we just learned, as well as knowledge that we didn't go over in the last lecture, and then say, okay, how are we gonna convert this into an MR image? Because we have different field strengths we can use uh, for clinical imaging. We have multiple different sequences, each with its own alphabet soup of terminology. We have multiple different options and parameters. And this combination of field strength sequences, options, and parameters is what translates into image quality, which as good aspects such as signal to noise ratio, contrast, spatial resolution, and some negative things such as acquisition time, artifacts, and spatial distortion. And this gets very, very complicated. It's almost like a convolutional neural network where every combination of field strengths can potentially be applied to every combination of sequences, to every combination of the parameters shown here. And these aren't even all the parameters that we have to play with. So how are we going to learn every single combination of things and figure out how to improve image quality? Well, if it sounds too complicated, in many ways it is, I wanna remind us that there are a few principles that are more important than this entire complicated network of lines. The first is do the correct exam. The second is to prepare your patient. And the third is to position the coils. And if you do those things, do the correct exam, prepare your patient, and position the coils, then you have won 95% of the battle. So I'm gonna spend a few minutes talking about 95% of the battle, and then I'm gonna spend the rest of the lecture talking about all this other stuff that's really only 5% of the battle. So let's talk about 95% of the battle. The first is prepare your patient. So, here is a T1 weighted image on a young woman, and we see a tremendous amount of susceptibility artifact coming from the region of her back. What went wrong on this image? What went wrong on this image is that we had forgotten to ask the patient to remove her brassiere, which had some metal uh, straps on it, and when we do, we get much better image quality. So have your patient remove any pieces of metal from their body that will improve image quality. And on the images above, no matter what we had done in terms of parameters, we would have been stuck with lousy images. Simply removing the brassiere takes the images from the top to the bottom. So remove metal objects. Give patients breathing instructions. 
On your left is what happens when you don't tell patients what to do. On your right is what happens when you tell patients what to do. So the image on the left was a case where the technologist called me and said that I cannot get the images to look good. I talked to the patient and I explained to the patient how important it is to hold his or her breath. I don't remember whether this was a man or a woman and notice that the image quality gets a lot better simply by telling a patient how important it is to hold his or her breath. Now, another question is, do you want to hold breath in inspiration or do you want to hold breath in expiration? So I want everyone to look at this image and in particular focus on this tumor over here and focus on this tumor over here and just ask yourself, which tumor looks more clearly demarcated and which tumor can we see uh, the so-called capsule around the tumor more clearly, which image looks blurrier. Both of these were acquired in a 20 second breath hold. The images are exactly the same, except that in one case, I asked this woman to hold her breath in inspiration, and in one, I asked her to hold her breath in expiration. So which is which? In this case, expiration is on your right. So if patients can hold their breaths in expiration, and not everyone can, but if they can, image quality is better in expiration. And the reason is that in inspiration, even if someone's holding their breath very, very well, the diaphragm will gradually relax. It may even quiver and shake a little bit, no matter what the patient does, and you will have some blurring, some motion artifact on inspiration. So if someone can hold their breath in expiration, do expiration. If they can't hold their breath in expiration, then obviously use common sense, then do inspiration and just do the best you can. So expiratory breath holds if possible. Put the coil in the right place. So this was a case, this was a case from many years ago where we wanted to image the axilla and the coil was placed over the arm. And notice when that happens, we don't see the axilla very well. So what do you do? Well, you put the coil in the right place and suddenly you can see the area of interest. So place the coils in the right place. If you're doing abdominal imaging, use a torso phased array coil. If you're using, if you're doing head imaging, do, you know, use, use a head coil. So on your left and on your right are two sets of images. And as these images go by, I just want you to ask yourself, which image is noisier, which image looks grainier, and which image looks uh, less grainy, less noisy. So you can look at the fat, for example, it, where is the fat brighter? You can look at uh, the spleen and ask yourself, which spleen looks grainier, which spleen looks more homogeneous? So these are T1 weighted images, but let's look at some other images. And for each image, just ask yourself, which images look like they have higher signal to noise and which ones look uh, grainier. And there's only one difference between the images on your left and the images on the right. And the difference is that the images on the left have a phased array coil, and the images on the right have the so-called body coil, which is the coil that's built in uh, to the gantry of the scanner, They're built into the, into the structure of the scanner. So use phased array coils, use head coils, use neck coils uh, whenever possible. It will improve uh, your signal to noise uh, ratio. Okay, so that's 95% of the game. If you do those three things, and that's just all common sense, then you're 95% of the way there. So now in the next 30 minutes or so, we're going to be talking about the other 5% by marching our way through this table. So we're going to march our way through the table and go over different parameters. We're going to talk about the effect of gadolinium, TR, flip angle, echo time, etc. cetera, uh, over the next uh, several minutes. So let's start with gadolinium. And uh, gadolinium-based contrast agents, we'll talk more about them in the next lecture, but for now just remember that gadolinium shortens T1, and this may or may not improve the T1 weighting. Gadolinium shortens the T2 and T2 star, and this usually has minimal effects on T2 and T2 star weighted images, which I'll show you in a moment. Uh, gadolinium has little or any effect on diffusion uh, weighted imaging and on the ADC, and I'll show you that in a second. And gadolinium increases the signal to noise of T1 weighted images. So we're gonna go through all of these things now with some examples. So first of all, let's look at the effect of gadolinium 
on different sequences. So we'll, we'll spend a little bit more time on this in the next few slides, but we're gonna look at the effect of gadolinium on T1 weighted images, uh, as well as T2 weighted images. So here we see pre-contrast, here we see post-contrast, and uh, we're gonna go through these things sort of one at a time. So first, let's look at gadolinium and T1 weighted images. So here we have uh, an, uh, an out-of-phase image. Notice that this is a fatty liver, so the liver looks dark. This is an in-phase image. You also know this is out-of-phase because you can see that there's India ink artifact between water-based structures and the surrounding adipose tissue. Now, one of these is pre-contrast and one of these is post-contrast, and can you tell which is which? Well, you probably can appreciate the fact that the liver got brighter when we gave the contrast, oh, sorry, in this image than on this image, you can probably appreciate that the liver is brighter here than here. So if you were gonna guess that this is post-contrast, you'd be right. So the image below is post-contrast, the image uh, above is pre-contrast. What I wanna draw your attention to now is the liver and the fat. So notice that pre-contrast, the liver is bright, but it's not as bright as the fat. So the liver is clearly darker than the adipose tissue. After we give contrast, notice that the liver becomes almost as bright as fat, and it's difficult to actually tell where the liver ends and where the fat begins. So post-contrast, the T1 of the liver shortens to become similar to that of fat. As a corollary, look at fat. Did fat change when you went from pre-contrast to post-contrast? The answer is really no. So gadolinium does not affect the signal from fat, gadolinium does affect the signal of water-based structures, whether those are liver or kidney or pancreas. So water-based structures get brighter, pure fat doesn't really change. Now gadolinium on T1-weighted images will dramatically shorten the signal-to-noise ratio, and we'll talk about that a little bit in the next lecture, uh, but for now you can look at this image and this image and this image were acquired with exactly the same sequence, exactly the same parameters, exactly the same calibration settings. The only difference is this image was acquired with gadolinium and this was not. And I think you can appreciate how much higher the signal to noise ratio is of the liver here than here. Look how much brighter the liver is. And this is different than on CT. When you do contrast on CT, it does not change the signal to noise ratio of the structure you're looking at. It changes the contrast to noise ratio, but doesn't change the signal to noise uh, ratio. So this is pre versus post. What about gadolinium and T2 weighted images? Does gadolinium affect the appearance of a T2 weighted image? And in order for us to look at that, I want you to look at this image, and I want you to look at this image, and I'll tell you that one of them is pre-contrast and one is post-contrast. And is there anyone here who can tell me which one is pre-contrast and which one is post-contrast? I would argue that both of these images, with one exception, which we'll talk about in a second, look essentially the same pre and post-contrast. So gadolinium does not affect the appearance of the liver. Gadolinium does not affect the appearance of the spleen. Gadolinium does not affect the appearance really of anything on a T2-weighted image in a way that's appreciable to the human eye, with one exception. This particular uh, case was, it was uh, created with a particular contrast agent known as gadozetate disodium, which accumulates in the bile duct. So was that as a hint, can anyone tell me which, which image is pre and which image is post? Well, if we look at this bile duct, the bile duct is very bright pre-contrast on a T2-weighted image, and this, contra this bile duct disappears post-contrast, and why is that? It's because this particular contrast agent gets into the bile duct and shortens the T2 of the bile duct and makes the bile duct go away. But uh, not literally go away, but makes it go away from our ability to see it. So this is pre-contrast and this is post-contrast. So T gadolinium does not affect the appearance of T2-weighted images with the exception of some contrast agents which will affect the appearance of the bile duct. Gadolinium also has very little effect on diffusion-weighted imaging. If you don't believe me, try to tell me which set of DWI images were pre-contrast and post-contrast. Can anyone tell me the difference between this or this or this or this 
Well, I certainly can't, they look the same to me, but above is pre-contrast and below is post-contrast. So gadolinium has essentially no effect on diffusion-weighted imaging. Now gadolinium does shorten T1 and T2. So remember from the previous lecture, we were sometimes plotting M, uh, X, Y. So now instead I'll be plotting signal intensity on the Y axis and time on the X axis. And remember that signal is gonna go from zero to a high of M naught. So now if we don't give any gadolinium, uh, we might have a tissue that relaxes with a curve that looks like this. If, uh, but uh, we typically don't wait an infinite amount of time. We typically wait a so-called repetition time to image it. So a tissue without gadolinium, after a repetition time of TR, will have this much signal. But we don't listen to the signal right away. We actually allow the signal to decay and remember that the decay is governed by a different exponential called T2 decay. But we don't allow the signal to decay an infinite amount of time. We allow the signal to decay only for a short amount of time called the echo time or TE. So we allow signal to grow during TR time, and then we allow the signal to decay during echo time, during TE time. And at, with a given TR and a given TE, this is how much signal we have when we acquire our image. Let's now give some gadolinium. And if we give a low concentration of gadolinium, the gadolinium shortens the T1 relaxation. So this tissue climbs towards its M0 faster. So that's why after a certain TR, it has more signal because it's climbing up faster. But the gadolinium also shortens the T2. So the signal will decay faster. I don't know if you can appreciate it, but this signal is going, is decaying faster than this signal. But nevertheless, a small amount of gadolinium on a T1-weighted image, we have more signal than we do if we didn't give any gadolinium at all. Okay, so giving a small amount of gadolinium helps. Maybe giving even more gadolinium helps even more. So if we give a medium amount of gadolinium, a slightly greater amount of gadolinium, we get, uh, again, we recover faster but we're gonna lose signal faster. And notice that the incremental gain is now quite small. So from no gadolinium to a small amount of gadolinium, there's a huge boost in signal. When we give more gadolinium, the incremental gain is very small. Let's give even more gadolinium and see what happens. If we give even more gadolinium, we recover faster. But notice that no matter how much gadolinium we give, we can never have more signal than M0. So gadolinium doesn't increase the signal above M0, it just allows us to reach M0 quicker. So high gadolinium, we've reached M0 by the time of TR. No gadolinium, we haven't reached M0, uh, but that's the only difference. Gadolinium doesn't change M0, it just gets us to M0 faster. But with high gadolinium, we now start losing more signal faster, and now look what happened. So high uh, gadolinium actually drove our signal back down to what it was like if we hadn't given any gadolinium at all on a T1 weighted image. Well, let's give even more gadolinium, an ultra high, let's give a gallon of gadolinium. What happens if you give a gallon of gadolinium? Well, you instantaneously get to M0, but look what happens now. You lose all your signal. So too much gadolinium, you actually have less signal than a small amount of gadolinium because of the T2 relaxation time. So one teaching point is there is an optimal uh, concentration of gadolinium to give. If you give too much gadolinium, you actually start losing signal. The other uh, teaching point is here. If you want to see high signal with gadolinium, do you want your echo time to be short or do you want it to be long? Well, let's shorten the echo time and see what happens. So I'm going to now take this echo time and start shortening it. And as I shorten it, look at all these curves and ask what's happening to the signal. So as I shorten the echo time, notice that the signal goes up. Even uh, for this very, very high gadolinium, the signal is higher than it was. And you can imagine that if I could do a TE of zero, if my TE was really, really short, then suddenly this tissue that has ultra high gadolinium concentration would have bright signal because I would have captured the image before 
it lost all its signal. So use the shortest TE possible when you're trying to do gadolinium enhanced imaging as a general rule. Okay, that was gadolinium. Now let's look at repetition time. So the repetition time has several effects. As you increase your TR, you increase your acquisition time, you increase your spatial coverage, your signal to noise goes up, and your T1 weighting decreases. In the interest of time, let's only talk about a couple of these things, signal to noise and T1 weighting. So let's look at the effect of TR on signal to noise. Here we have a TR of 10 milliseconds, 20, 40, 80, 160, 320. All of these images were acquired with the same exact sequence. In this case, a two-dimensional SPGR flip angle 50 TE 2.4. You don't need to memorize this for now. Just for now, just remember that all of these images were acquired with exactly the same sequence. Notice that as our TR goes from 10 to 320, the signal to noise goes up. Look how dark the liver is here. Look how bright the liver and spleen are here. So as the TR goes up, the signal to noise goes up. But notice something else happening. Notice that the T1 weighting goes down. And to illustrate that, I want you to now look at the difference between liver and fat. See how the liver and fat difference is quite accentuated here because of the differences in T1. As our TR goes up, the signal to noise goes up, but notice that we start losing T1 weighting. The liver is no longer much darker than the fat. The liver is approaching the fat in its intensity. Let me just change the window level settings here again to show you again how much darker the liver is uh, than the fat. So with short TR, we have signal starved images, but the T1 weighting is very high. With very high TR, we have a lot more signal, but we lose T1 weighting. And that's why sometimes the optimal image may have an intermediate uh, repetition time, which sort of uh, is a trade-off between SNR and T1 weighting. So why is this? Well, let's look now at four different tissues. A tissue such as water with very long T1 and other tissues that have ultra short T1, very short T1, short T1, and intermediate T1. So notice that if our TR is very, very long, all of these tissues have high signal. Even this tissue here with long T1 has pretty high signal. But look at these tissues here, intermediate, short, very short, ultra short. They all look the same, don't they? All of them have, they're all maxed out. So very long TR, we have a lot of signal, but everything has high signal, and we can't tell the difference between two different tissues. Let's see what happens when we shorten the TR. And as we shorten the TR, what I want you to be thinking about is, are we starting to separate these tissues from one another, and what's happening to the signal to noise? So let's shorten the TR, and as we shorten the TR, you can see that the signal is going down, but notice that we're now able to separate these tissues. And when we do a very short TR, some of these tissues have very poor signal, but notice that we've now separated all the tissues from one another. So our T1 weighting is very high, but our signal to noise can be quite low. And now let's go the other direction again. We're now gonna increase the TR, and as we increase the TR, notice that the signal to noise goes up, but now we start losing our ability to separate tissues, our T1 weighting goes down. Okay, now let's talk about flip angle. Flip angle is something else that affects T1 weighting. As we increase the flip angle, several things happen. So as we increase the flip angle, the echo time may increase, the TR may increase, the acquisition time may increase, the T1 weighting does increase, the signal to noise increases and decreases, and there's something known as the Ernst angle. So we're gonna focus in the interest of time on these three things. The effect of flip angle on T1 weighting, the effect on flip angle on signal to noise, and what the heck is this Ernst angle? So let's start first by showing you an example. Now this is the same exact sequence, um, and the details, if you care to know them, it's a 2D SPGR TR125 TE 2.6 milliseconds, but acquired with a flip angle of one, a flip angle of five, a flip angle of 10, 25, 50, 
So what happens as the flip angle increases? Well, obviously, as the flip angle increases, the signal goes from very, very low and gets higher. So the signal to noise increases. And although you can't necessarily tell from these images, I'll tell you that the signal to noise actually peaks at around, in this case, a flip angle of 50 and then starts to go down. So unlike TR, where the signal to noise is continuously increasing, with flip angle, the signal to noise reaches a peak and then starts to go down. And I'll show you some more examples later that will make this more clear. The other thing that happens is notice that as the flip angle increases, the T1 weighting increases, right? So if I showed you this image and said, can you tell me where the liver is and tell me where the liver begins and ends and where the fat begins and ends, you'd have a lot of trouble. The liver and fat have very similar signal intensity. But if I were to tell you on this image or this image to tell me where the liver and spleen begin and end and where the fat begin and end, you'd be able to tell me. The reason is that these images have high T1 weighting, these images have very low T1 weighting. Uh, and this is the same exact phenomenon, but now with a different sequence. So before I was showing you a two-dimensional sequence, this is now a three-dimensional sequence with a TR of 4.1 and a TE of 1.7, in case you care. And these are now the flip angles, flip angle 1, 5, 10, and 15. One thing to appreciate is that with three-dimensional sequences, we typically use short TRs, this is 4.1 milliseconds. With two-dimensional sequences, we usually use longer TRs. So this one, for example, is a TR of 125. Because this is a longer TR, notice that these flip angles have a broader range. This one is going all the way to flip angle of 75. With the 3D sequence, which has a shorter TR, four milliseconds, notice that our flip angle range is lower. This particular case only goes to 15. Now, for those of you who are not following all these details, don't worry so much. Just, just know that different sequences have their own flip angle ranges. And earlier, I was showing you one flip angle range. Now, I'm showing you another flip angle range. But what I want you to notice here, again, is that with flip angle one, there's very low signal to noise. As the flip angle increases, the signal to noise increases. As the signal to noise increases, uh, the T1 weighting increases. And if you don't believe me, what I want you to look at now is look at the liver look at the pancreas and look at the spleen. Does everyone here agree that the spleen is darker than the pancreas and the liver? I think the answer is yes. Everyone probably agrees that the spleen looks darker. What about flip angle of five? Does everyone agree that the spleen is darker than the pancreas or the liver? Um, I suspect most of you would have a difficulty saying for sure that the spleen is darker. So the T1 weighting on this image is lower than the T1 weighting on this image. Um, so the T1 weighting increases as the flip angle increases. But I'll tell you that the signal to noise is peaking at about here, a flip angle of 10, and the signal to noise is lower at a flip angle of 15. Now some of you think I'm going crazy because you look at these two images and it's hard for you to say that one of them is a higher signal to noise than the other. So now let me show you that. This is flip angle 10, this is flip angle 15, and I hope I can convince you that this has a higher signal to noise than that. If I can't convince you of that, then let me now take a piece of that image and superimpose it. Can you appreciate that this liver is darker than this liver? So this has lower signal than this image, okay? Let me do that again. This image has lower signal than this image, and if you don't believe me, oops, uh, there is the proof right there. Okay, so uh, with flip angle, as the flip angle goes up, the T1 weighting goes up. The signal to noise also goes up, up to a certain point, and then peaks, and then starts to come back down. Now, this is yet one more example of T1 weighting. So here we have two images with an agent, gatozetate, that gets into the bile ducts, flip angle 15 versus flip angle 25. So I hope you can appreciate that with a flip angle of 25, the liver is just a little bit darker here than here. Uh, but the other thing that with a higher flip angle, I don't know if you can appreciate this, but you can see a little, you can see the gadolinium in the bile duct better with a flip angle of 25 than a flip angle of 15. So the teaching point here is that higher flip angles have more T1 weighting. In this case, we see the gadolinium in the bile duct better with a flip angle of 25 than we do with a flip angle of 15. But the signal to noise is higher here than here because the signal to noise will peak at a certain flip angle. So now you might ask, okay, so the flip angle, as the flip angle goes up, the signal goes up and then comes back down. 
So what flip angle maximizes the signal to noise? Well, you can figure that out because there's, a, there's an equation that looks like this. So the signal intensity on a gradient echo image is a function of the flip angle. So here we have sine of flip angle, here we have cosine of flip angle. It's also a function of the repetition time and the T1. So I don't want anyone here, except for a few of you, to memorize this equation, but I do want you to just pay attention that this equation, which is the signal intensity we see on a gradient echo, has flip angle, has TR, and has T1 as important parameters. And now let's plug those parameters into Excel and create some curves. So I'm going to look at the signal intensity on the y-axis and the flip angle on the x-axis. I'm gonna let the flip angle go from zero to 90 degrees. And so flip angle is one parameter. Remember the other parameters are TR and T1. So let's start with a TR of five milliseconds. So I'm arbitrarily making the TR five milliseconds. I could have made it 10. I could have made it 4.9, I could have made it pi, but I'm making it five, okay? And let's start with a T1 of 100 milliseconds. So now I'm gonna plug in that formula that I showed you in the previous slide and let the flip angle go from zero to 90. And when I do that, I get this. So can everyone appreciate that as the flip angle increases, the signal to noise goes from zero, it reaches a peak, and then it comes back down, okay? And then you ask yourself, okay, well, what is that flip angle that maximizes the signal? Well, this is given by the so-called Ernst angle, which is given by this equation over here. Notice that this equation has arc cosine in it, it has TR and it has T1. Uh, and there's a flip angle that maximizes uh, the signal for any tissue that has a T1 of 100 milliseconds and a TR of five milliseconds. You plug in this equation, that is the flip angle that maximizes it. And visually, it looks like it's about 12 degrees or something like that. So then you say, okay, well, what if the T1, oh, and this Ernst angle comes, is named after this individual over here. So what if the T1 is not 100 milliseconds? What if the T1 is 200 milliseconds? What does the curve look like? Well, the curve looks like this. And what if the flip angle is, so what if the T1 is 600 milliseconds and the curve looks like this? So notice a few observations. The observations are that as the T1 goes from 600 to 200 to 100, the overall signal goes up. Also notice that the Ernst angle goes up. So the Ernst angle that maximizes the signal for T1 600 might be five degrees, whereas the flip angle that maximizes the signal for something that has a T1 of 100 milliseconds might be about 12 degrees. So this is with a TR of five milliseconds. Let's now look at a TR of 150 milliseconds and see, do we see a similar pattern? Uh, and the answer is yes, we do. With a T1 of 100, we see something that looks like this, and this is the Ernst angle. If the T1 is 200, we see a curve that looks like this, and this is the Ernst angle. If we see a T1 of 600, it looks like this, and this is the Ernst angle. So now let's put these two curves side by side and make some more observations. So notice that when we go from TR5 to TR150, all other things being equal, the signal goes up. See, all of these curves have higher peaks than these. Notice that for any given TR, uh, as the T1 increases, the signal goes up. As the T1 increases, the signal goes up. Uh, notice that for any given TR, as the signal increases, the Ernst angle goes up, right? So the Ernst angle here is lower than here, lower than here, same thing. The Ernst angle is going up. And finally, notice that for TR150 as opposed to TR5, the Ernst angles are much higher. So what does that mean? So that means that if you're doing a 3D sequence that has a TR of about five milliseconds, you're probably gonna pick a flip angle of about 15 degrees because that's gonna be the Ernst angle of tissues with a T1 of 100. But if you're doing a TR of 150, you might actually be using uh, flip angles more like 70 to 80, because those are gonna be the Ernst angles of things that have T1s of 100 or 200. So can everyone appreciate that you want higher flip angle when you use a higher TR or similar degrees of T1 uh, weighting? Okay, so that was flip angle. Let's look at TE. So lots of things happen as we increase 
the TE, uh, and they're listed here. But in the interest of time, let's focus on four things. As the TE increases, the T2 and T2 star weighting changes. Notice that I say changes, not necessarily increases or decreases, and I'll explain what I mean by that in a moment. As the TE increases, your SNR decreases. As the TE increases, susceptibility artifacts increase. And with TE, you can get out of phase and in phase, which we talked about in the last lecture, and we'll talk about it again just briefly today again. Okay, so let's look at the effect of TE on T2, T2 star, and signal to noise. So this is a single shot fast spin echo sequence uh, imaged uh, at a TE of 41, 82, 164, and 328 milliseconds. So can everyone appreciate that as the T1 increases, the signal to noise decreases, this image is much darker than this. Can also everyone appreciate that the T2 weighting changes? So for example, if we look at a very high TE sequence such as this, we can see that the CSF is very bright, the cerebral spinal fluid surrounding the spine is very bright. Look how bright this liquid looks. And look how bright uh, the liquid, the urine looks in the collecting systems of the kidney. Um, when we go to a shorter uh, uh, TE, uh, the image on the whole is brighter, but notice that the cerebrospinal fluid now no longer looks so bright. And the reason is that uh, the cerebrospinal fluid here is just as bright as it is here, but the other tissues are darker. So the reason the cerebrospinal fluid doesn't look so bright here is simply that the other tissues are also bright and it doesn't look so bright uh, by comparison. So a lot of people will say that the T2 weighting increases as the TE increases, and they show an example like this. Look how bright I see the liquid in the cerebrospinal fluid. But I would argue that it's not so much T2 weighting is increasing, I would say the T2 weighting is changing. And to illustrate that, let me show you this example over here. So this is a patient uh, image at TE 40, 70, 100, 180. And I think we can appreciate that the liver got darker uh, as the TE increased. And I think maybe you can appreciate that relative to the rest of the image, the cerebrospinal fluid looks brighter here than it does on some of these other images. But is it fair to say that this image is more T2 weighted than this image? And I would say not necessarily, because I need to tell you something else about this patient. This patient has a complication of chemotherapy known as sinusoidal, uh, sorry, sinusoidal obstruction syndrome, SOS. Now, without getting into the details of what SOS is, let me just say that SOS is an important diagnosis to make. And on imaging, it manifests as this sort of spidery nutmeg pattern of high signal uh, of the liver. So on which of these images can you appreciate that the liver is heterogeneous? I would argue that the heterogeneity of the liver is most obvious maybe on a TE70 or even a TE40 than it is on a TE180. So the T2 weighting depends on what you're trying to see. If what you're trying to see is bright cerebral spinal fluid, you would say this is the most T2 weighted sequence. If, on the other hand, the purpose of your sequence is to detect the parenchymal abnormality of SOS, you would say this sequence is the one that best shows the SOS. This is the best T2 weighted sequence. So the T2 weighting depends on the tissue or the tissues that you're trying to characterize. At any rate, another thing I want to point out is that on spin echo sequences, the range of TEs might go from say 40 to 180 or even as shown on the previous example, from 40 you know, to 300 or something like that. That's on spin echo uh, type sequences. On gradient echo sequences, we lose signal much more rapidly, so the echo range tends to be shorter. So here we're looking at liver and spleen going from one millisecond down to 4.8 milliseconds. And notice again, we see a similar pattern. As the TE increases, we lose signal to noise, things get darker, uh, but also notice that the 
uh, range of echo times is much shorter on gradient echo uh, sequences. Um, let me skip this in the interest of time, and let me just go now to this, that on gradient echo sequences, fat and water periodically go out of phase and in phase. So this is a three Tesla scanner, and on the previous lecture we mentioned that fat and water at three Tesla are out of phase at 1.15 milliseconds, in phase at 2.3, out of phase 3.45, in phase, out of phase, in phase, out of phase, in phase, etc. Notice that as the signal, as the TE, sorry, increases, overall there's a pattern, a trend for the signal to go down. So let's compare this image with a TE of 1.15 with this image with a TE of 8.05, and I think you can appreciate that the signal of the liver went down. Similarly, you can look at this image, TE 2.3, and compare it to this image, TE 9.2. So as TE increases, signal goes down. Notice also that as uh, the image goes from out of phase to in phase to out of phase, uh, the fatty liver is a little bit dark, bright, dark, bright, dark, bright, so the signal oscillates. Um, also notice that the India ink artifact, here we have India ink, here we don't, here we do, here we don't, etc. And finally, I want to show you susceptibility. This particular patient had a liver transplant, and here we see this, this little black thing. What's that little black thing? Well, that little black thing is the signal void caused by magnetic field heterogeneity from a tiny little clip. So this patient has a tiny little surgical clip right there that causes susceptibility artifact and you get this black blob. But this is pretty small. Notice that the black blob gets bigger and bigger and bigger as the TE uh, increases. Similarly, there's a little bit of susceptibility here from the stomach. And notice that it barely bothers you when you have a TE of 1.15. But let's look at the susceptibility as the TE increases. And notice that by the time we get to a TE of 9.2, now we see quite a bit of artifact. Also, I don't know if you guys can appreciate it, but this patient has another tiny surgical clip right here. And you see that little black blob right there. Notice that surgical clip is invisible, TE 1.15. You can't see it at all. So sometimes you want to see surgical clips, sometimes you don't. If you want to see surgical clips, use a long echo time. If you don't want to use surgical clips, use a short echo time. Now, I mentioned before that the TE affects the signal to noise and the T2 weighting, and now let's illustrate that uh, graphically. So here we have a tissue with very long T2. It loses signal very, very slowly. At the other extreme, we have a tissue like cartilage uh, that loses signal very, very rapidly, ultra short T2. And in between, we have other tissues. So when we have a very long TE, notice that all the tissues have lost signal, but some tissues have lost more signal than others. With a long TE, we're able to separate some tissues from each other, but notice that we can't separate all tissues, right? So the tissue with short TE and the tissue with ultra short TE look identical with a very long TE. Both of them have zero signal. So let's see what happens when we decrease the TE. As we decrease the TE, notice that eventually we're able to separate these two tissues. So when we say that long, so this is another way of saying that the TE that maximizes the T2 weighting depends on the tissue or tissues you're trying to characterize or separate. So if I'm trying to separate short T2 from ultra short T2, I want to use a very short TE. If, on the other hand, I want to separate a uh, very long T2 from long T2, then I want to use a long TE. Does that make sense? The TE you pick depends on the tissues or abnormalities you're trying to differentiate. Let's look at bandwidth now. Now, bandwidth is a very important parameter that affects multiple different things. In the interest of time, we will focus on three things. The bandwidth decreases the signal to noise, the bandwidth decreases the chemical shift, and the bandwidth increases image sharpness. 
And I'm not gonna take a mathematical approach to this because it's kind of complicated. Instead, I'll just show you some examples. So here we have um, a sequence. Uh, here are the details in case you care. And this particular individual was imaged with a bandwidth of plus or minus 50, plus or minus 100, plus or minus 160, plus or minus 250. Now, even if you don't really know what bandwidth is, you can appreciate that the bandwidth is going up. And as the bandwidth goes up, notice that the images become more and more grainy. And so to illustrate that, let me maximize a little bit. And can you appreciate that this image is a little bit grainier than this image? So as the bandwidth goes up, the signal to noise goes down by a little bit. Um, how much does it go down? Well, if the bandwidth doubles, the signal to noise goes down by the square root of two. If the bandwidth goes up by a factor of four, the signal to noise goes down by a factor of two. So then the question is, why would you ever want to have a high bandwidth? If high bandwidth reduces your signal to noise, why would you ever want to use a high bandwidth? Well, this is why you might want to use a high bandwidth. So here's a T2 weighted sequence, bandwidth 21, 42, and 83. And what I want you to ask yourselves is, which image is the sharpest? And let me now magnify the pancreas a little bit. And you can ask yourself, in which image is the interface between the pancreas and the surrounding fat the sharpest? And I think, I hope, I, I hope you all appreciate that this image is sharper than this image, and this image is sharper than this image, which is quite blurry. So as the bandwidth goes up, the image sharpness goes up. And if anyone's interested in why this is, I can explain it later, but here is a pictorial representation. What about chemical shift? So chemical shift, again, is the spatial mismapping of the water image relative to the fat image, which creates an artifact of a bright band and a dark band, which can be a little bit distracting. So here we have an image with a bandwidth of 31, and here we have an image with a bandwidth of 50. And let's magnify uh, these images. And I hope you can appreciate that there is a thicker black line here, a thicker white line here than here. So the chemical shift is less when you increase the bandwidth. The chemical shift is more when you decrease the bandwidth. I mentioned earlier that increasing the bandwidth does decrease the signal to noise. I think you can probably maybe appreciate the fact that the aorta looks a little bit more heterogeneous here than it does here, which is a manifestation of reduced signal to noise. I don't know if you can appreciate it, but on my screen I can tell that the bone marrow looks more heterogeneous here than here. So increasing the bandwidth, signal to noise goes down. However, image sharpness goes up. Now here the difference was 31 to 50. So what's the difference in the SNR? Well, if it had gone from 31 to 62, then this would have the square root of two less signal to noise than this. This difference is a little bit less than two. So this image probably is about 30% less signal to noise uh, than that one. Okay, let's now look at the number of slices for a 3D acquisition. Um, the number of slices in a 3D acquisition is analogous to the number of excitations. Um, and also, it is uh, proportional to the acquisition time. But what I want to talk about today is that the signal to noise is proportional to the square root of the number of slices. So to illustrate that, let me show you an image of the liver and spleen, a three-dimensional sequence acquired with eight slices, 24 slices, 46 slices, and 92 slices. And can you all appreciate that the SNR is going up as the number of slices increases. So this is maybe not so intuitive. You might be saying, no, I don't understand something. Why would it matter whether I collect eight slices or 24 slices or 92 slices? Why does the number of slices affect the SNR? It affects the SNR on a 3D acquisition. And what I'm gonna to do to prove that to you is I'm gonna take these slices and now create a coronal reformation of the eight slices, 24, 46, and 92, and it looks like this. So these eight slices were generated from this much 
tissue volume. These 24 slices were generated from this much tissue volume, and these 92 slices were generated from this much tissue volume. So there's a lot more volume being imaged here than here, and as a result, each slice here has more signal because it's the total volume of signal that contributes to the signal to noise uh, ratio. At any rate, why is this important? This is important because if someone can't hold their breath and or if for some reason you want very high temporal resolution image, one way of getting higher temporal resolution imaging is to decrease the number of slices. So 46 slices takes half as much time as 92 slices. 24 slices takes about a uh, half of 46 slices, and eight slices takes one third as much time as 24 slices. So you might want to decrease the number of slices to decrease the acquisition time, but just be aware that when you decrease the number of slices, you're decreasing the SNR. Okay, let's look at parallel imaging. Parallel imaging has multiple different effects. The one that I want to emphasize today is that parallel imaging reduces diffusion weighted imaging artifacts. And to prove that to you, I'm going to show you diffusion weighted imaging with B values of 0, 250, and 500. And I want everyone in this room to just ask themselves which set of images, the top or the bottom, has fewer artifacts. And I think I can probably convince you that these images look cleaner and these images have a lot more artifacts with sort of these so-called N over 2 ghosts with uh, abnormal spurious signals sort of superimposed above and below. And what's the difference between this image and this image? The only difference is that this was acquired with parallel imaging and this was acquired without. I don't have time to explain it, but I'd be happy to explain it later if anyone has any questions. Parallel imaging is essential for diffusion-weighted imaging. It reduces uh, these uh, artifacts. And finally, while we're talking about diffusion-weighted imaging, let's talk about the B value. The B value has multiple different effects on diffusion-weighted imaging, but I only want to emphasize two. The B value increases the diffusion-weighted imaging and it reduces the signal to noise. Everything gets darker. So let's illustrate this. So here we have a diffusion-weighted imaging sequence with a B value of zero. So zero is a very low B value. In fact, it's the lowest B value you can use. And when you use a very low B value, notice that there's a lot of things that are bright. So the ascites is bright, the liquid in the stomach uh, is bright, uh, there are blood vessels that are bright, there are bile ducts that are bright, the cerebral spinal fluid is very bright. So a lot of things are bright when the B value equals zero. Now, can anyone see the metastases in this patient's liver, or can anyone see the lymph nodes uh, in the porta hepatis? Pretty difficult to see them, right? But then if we increase the B value, now notice that the cerebrospinal fluid, which was bright, is now dark. And because the cerebrospinal fluid is dark, we now see the spinal cord, because the spinal cord did not get darker. This was the adrenal gland before, which we didn't notice. Now the adrenal gland is very obvious. This ends up being a lymph node, and this is a lymph node. We didn't really notice those, but now we see these lymph nodes. And this is a metastasis right here, which we didn't notice before. And here, there's a metastasis right here, which we didn't notice before, but now they stand out. And notice that the liquid in the stomach, which was a little bit distracting before, uh, is now much darker. So um, this image uh, has a lot of, well, this image is more diffusion weighted than this image, and we can now see the differences between structures based on diffusion weighted uh, imaging. And I'll just show you a few more examples that as the B value goes up, lesion conspicuity goes up. So the B value is shown here, so this is a B value of zero. And can anyone see a metastasis in this liver? Uh, I can't. Let's increase the B value to 50. Actually, this is kind of interesting. So notice that when you go from B0 to B50, uh, the, a lot of the blood vessels and a lot of the bile ducts, which were previously distracting, go dark. And with a B value of 100, even more of them uh, become dark. Now let's go to a B value of 500. And now we're starting, now all the blood vessels are dark. And now we're starting to see a metastasis. Oops, uh, sorry, I didn't go any higher than this. And here is the metastasis right here. 
and there's a lymph node right there. How about this? Can anyone see a metastasis here, B value of zero? I can't see it, but let's now do a B value of 1,000, and now we see metastasis, metastasis, lymph node. Can anyone see the metastasis here? B value equals zero, hard to be sure. We go to a B value of uh, 1,000, and we see that there's not only one metastasis, there's two. And so you might have guessed that this was a metastasis, but I'd be willing to bet not a single person in this room thought that was a metastasis, and yet there it is. Okay, now another thing I want to point out is that everything gets darker. So this is something that a lot of residents and a lot of fellows get wrong. A lot of residents, a lot of fellows think that as the B value goes up, uh, some things get brighter. And the answer is nothing gets brighter. Everything gets darker. It's just that some things get darker fast and some things get darker slowly. So let's look at the spleen, the kidney, the, the CSF, and the liver, as well as the gallbladder. And you'll see that as the B value goes from zero to 50, everything got darker, although maybe for the spleen it wasn't so obvious. As the B value goes from 50 to 500, everything is getting darker. And as the B value goes from 500 to 1,000, everything gets uh, darker. Even the spleen got darker. The spleen is darker here than it was here. You just maybe can't tell so much because the spleen is only a little bit darker, whereas, for example, the fluid in the gallbladder and the CSF are much darker as the B value goes up. Now, here is an example of a cancer in the liver, B value 50, and here it is at B value 500. And let me put the two images side by side. And um, some, you know, this lesion compared to background liver might look brighter here than here, but I promise you that the lesion is darker here on the high B value than it was. And just to illustrate that, I take the tumor and put it here. And you can see that this tumor actually got darker. It just didn't get as dark as other structures in the background. Okay, so what we've talked about uh, today in this second lecture is the effect of multiple different uh, changes in parameters on uh, image quality. Uh, this is a table that if anyone is interested in this lecture, uh, just email me or maybe we can distribute it to all the residents and you can sort of read this uh, table and kind of go over what is the effect of different parameters on different, uh, sorry, of different imaging parameters on different uh, parameters of image quality. Uh, in this table. And what I tried to do today is rather than go through this entire table in its entirety, I tried to pick off and show some examples of some of the more important relationships between imaging parameters and image quality. But I will not go over this entire table. It's too detailed, but it's there for you in case you want to uh, study it uh, at your leisure. And one of the things we talked about is gadolinium, which is now going to be the topic of the next uh, lecture.